Well, I want to thank you for allowing me to share with you again this week. So I guess the fact that I'm back, that's a good thing. I didn't get fired from the last time, so that's good. So that's always a, a positive thing. So uh, I wanted to share with you uh, a story. I, I saw this on the internet, and it says, uh, I know I shouldn't have done this, but I'm 83 years old, and I was in the McDonald's drive through this morning, and the young lady behind me leaned on her horn and started mouthing something because I was taking too long to place my order. That's not right. I know I'd be pretty upset if somebody's doing that behind me. <clears throat> so, when I, so when I got to the first window, I paid for her order along with my own. The cashier must have told her what I'd done because as, we'd moved, uh, as we moved up, she leaned out her window and waved to me and mouthed, thank you. Obviously embarrassed that I, had, that I had repaid her rudeness with a kindness. When I got to the second window, I showed them both receipts and took her food too. Now she has to go back to the end of the queue and start all over again. <laughs> I saw another uh, story online. This one was a little bit younger, and it says this as a note. It says this, when I was eight years old, my neighbor's dog kept pooping on my yard. So one day, I pooped in his yard. <laughs> so there we go. So whether you're 83 or whether you're eight years old, there's people that do you dirty. They do you wrong. They, they, they do things intentionally to harm you, to hurt you, to embarrass you. They do things to make your life rough on purpose. And, and like whether you're 83, whether you're eight, it happens. Okay? And, and for most of us, I know for me, when people do me wrong, my response is, I want to make it right. I want to get them back. I want to make it right. And that's kind of the natural response. Um, and sometimes that, that comes with bitterness, anger, things like that. And, and that's what we uh, usually feel when, we, we, when someone does us wrong, they do us dirty. Uh, so today what I want to talk about is I want to show a, a, a character in the Bible, Joseph, uh, who was done dirty, done wrong, and, and his response. Okay? But what I want to focus on, his response is great, but I want to focus on why he responded the way he did. What caused him to respond the way he did? So we're going to, um, before we go to the passage, uh, the whole story of Joseph is 13 chapters long, so we're not going to read all 13 chapters today. So that's a good thing, so we're not going to be here all day. Um, so starting in, in verse, uh, chapter 37 is where, it, so if you want to read it on your own, Genesis 37 is where the story of Joseph starts. And Joseph was the young, or was one, um, 12 brothers, he was one of 12 brothers, um, and their father was Jacob, who was one of the founding fathers of the nation of Israel. And so Jacob, his father, made it no secret that, he w that Joseph was his favorite. So he gave him a coat of many colors, you know, he favored him, and his brothers were jealous. They didn't like him. So they decided what they were going to do about it was, first of all, they wanted to kill him. And they said, well, I, I, that's a little harsh. We don't want to get blood on our hands. Not that we cared about Joseph. We just didn't want to get blood on our hands. So, um, so they said, instead of killing him, let's sell him into slavery. So they, they saw a group of traders going by. They sold him to those traders, uh, you know, took him away from his family and sold him into bondage, which is just a, ter a terrible life. And so Joseph ends up... Um, being sold to an Egyptian named Potiphar, and he works for Potiphar, uh, and does a good job for Potiphar, actually. Uh, Potiphar's house, everything runs real smoothly with, with Joseph working for Potiphar. Um, and so he's doing, a, doing the right thing, doing what he's supposed to do, and all of a sudden he gets done dirty again. He gets thrown in jail for something he didn't do. So he gets thrown in jail. So he's in jail. Again, he's doing what he's supposed to do. The warden really likes Joseph, puts him in charge of the other prisoners, uh, and then two of the prisoners that, that Joseph happens to be taken care of work for Pharaoh, the king. And they work for the king, and they, they have these dreams they need interpreted. And so Joseph says, well, I, I can tell you what those dreams mean. Long story short, short, one of those two gets to go back to Pharaoh and work. And Joseph said, hey, when you go back to work, tell your boss, tell Pharaoh about me here so that I can kind of get out of here. He forgets. He, he just forgets about him. He gets done wrong again. So he's in jail for a couple more years. Then Pharaoh has a dream. It needs interpreted. So the guy that he uh, was in jail said, oh, yeah, when I was in jail, this guy interpreted my dream. So now uh, Pharaoh sent for Joseph. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, and, it and the dream was a warning from God saying, hey, there's a famine coming. You guys better do something about it. And so Joseph kind of gives them some ideas of what they should do. And Pharaoh says, well, you sound like you know what you're doing. You're going to be my second in command, and you're going to be in charge of this uh, to prepare for the famine so that that way when the famine hits, we're going to have food. So Joseph does his job. Egypt is prepared. The famine hits the world. Everybody else around is starving except for Egypt because they have all this food. So naturally, people start coming and moving to Egypt, including Joseph's family. They move to Egypt too, um, looking for food. 
Uh, and then, long story short, they, they find Joseph, they reunite with Joseph, the whole family moves to Egypt, and this is where uh, we pick up. So in uh, chapter 50, uh, verse, verses 14 through 21, it says, After burying Jacob, so Joseph's father had just died, after burying Jacob, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had accompanied him to his father's burial. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong that we did to him. So in other words, his brothers are like, uh-oh, our father's gone. There's no one here to kind of like hold Joseph back. Joseph has a lot of power now, so he's in a good position to pay us back for everything we did to him. So they were really scared. And I would be too if, if I made someone that powerful, that angry. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, your servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. So, you know, you're thinking, if I'm Joseph, I'm thinking, oh, you guys are in so much trouble. You guys are going to get it now. But that's not how Joseph responds. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. And so in this story of Joseph, you know, like I said, I would, if it was me, boy, I would be ready to lay the hammer down to those guys. Like, I, they were going to get it. But, you know, Joseph, he, he reacted completely differently than what a lot of people would do. And, and so what I want to focus on is why Joseph did that. Why did Joseph respond that way? What caused him to respond that way? And what I believe is there are three, if we look at Joseph's response to his brothers, there are three attributes of God, three characteristics of God that Joseph remembers and, and with each characteristic is a promise. And I think when Joseph remembers those characteristics of God and remembers those promises of God, that's what allows him to respond the way he did. So the first uh, attribute of God is the justice of God. And we see this in Joseph's response in verse 19. Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? So what Joseph is saying is like, look, God is going to make this right. It's not my job to make it right. I'm not God. I can't punish you. God will make it right. And, and so a lot of times when we get wronged, and I know I'm this way, if I get wronged, I want to make it right. I want to make things right because, you know, I want to prove to everybody that I was right, you were wrong for treating me that way, and I'm going to get you back. I want to make things right. But that's not what Joseph was saying, is that, that Joseph was trusting the, the justice of God. No, God will make things right. And I know in my life what I've found to be true is that when I try to make things right, I usually make a mess of things. You know, when I try to get someone back or I try to spite somebody, it really doesn't hurt them too much. It ends up hurting me. That's really what usually happens. It, I try to spite somebody. You ever hear that nose? You cut off your nose to spite your face. That's kind of what usually happens, I know, to me when I try to make things right myself. I end up not doing what I wanted to do and get them back, and I end up carrying bitterness, anger, revenge in my heart, and that, doesn't, that just eats away at me, and it does nothing to them. And so... You know, it's, uh, so God is the one that makes it right, not us. Uh, God said in Romans um, chapter 12, verse 19, he says, uh, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. And so what we have here, if you can see the justice of God, is God says, I will pay them back. It's not going to go unnoticed. And that's what we talk about, why we talk about the justice of God, is that he is just, and he, your slight will not go unnoticed. Because God takes care of it in one of two, two ways, okay? First of all, the first way that he takes care of it, and he will pay them back, number one, if they don't know him, they will experience his wrath for all eternity in hell. And that's not, it's not something that's made up to be scary. Oh, it's real. God's wrath, he will take care of it. So every slight against you will be taken care of, either by his wrath in hell, or if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, Jesus has taken that wrath upon him on the cross. So therefore, one of two things are going to happen. Either, uh, you know, when you get slighted, it's either going to be paid for by them, 
or by Christ, one of the two, but it will be taken care of. And that's something that we can remember is that everything that happens to you, it's not unimportant to God. It's not going to say, well, just, just suck it up and let it go. No, it will be taken care of. And you don't have to take care of it. God will take care of it one of, one of those ways, either uh, his wrath on them or Christ will take their wrath if they choose to accept him. So it will be taken care of. It will not be, uh, we don't need to take care of it ourselves, And we don't have to have that burden of that anger and just bitterness because God will take care of it. The next attribute that Joseph references is the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty is just a big word that means God is in control. There is nobody higher than him. He does what he wants to do. There's nobody telling him he can't do that or nobody that can stop him from doing what he wants to do. So God is in control. And that's in um, verse 20 where Joseph told his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. You see, what we have here in that, in that statement is that you have their intentions and you have God's intentions. Their intentions were to harm. God's intentions were for good. And so there's a relationship between those intentions there, between their intentions and God's intentions. And you can look at it a couple of ways. The first way that you can look at it is that God's intentions override their intentions. So they intend to hurt you. God overrides it and says, nope, 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 it's going to be for good. And that's one way to look at it. And that's kind of how it, how it does happen, um, is that God's intentions override theirs. But the way I want to look at it, too, another way, and I think this is a little bit more, more it shows God's power even more, is that their intentions serve God's intentions. In other words, it's not a plan B. God didn't say, oh, those people are being mean. I got to go do something about it. No, their intentions are part of God's plan in the first place. It's, uh, it's kind of like when, if you've ever watched a youth basketball game, and I'm saying like a level below high school basketball, anything below high school basketball, and you go to a youth game, and some of these kids playing for the first time, and, and this is something, when I played basketball, this is something I never wanted to do um, when I got in. You see those kids that get in the game, and they've not really played before. They don't really know what's going on, so they start taking off, and they start going the wrong way. You ever see that happen? They start going the wrong way, and everybody's going, no, no, no. And they're trying really hard, and they're dribbling. And they lay it up, and they're like, yes, I just scored. And they're like, you scored for the other team. And they're like, you know, oh, man. That's kind of how, how this it works with God, is that their intentions, they were intending, just like that kid was intending to score one for his team, they were intending to, to hurt you. What ends up happening is they score one for God's team. God, it was all part of the plan in the first place. If you look at, at Joseph's story, you can kind of see how that works, is that Joseph belonged to a family. They were out in the desert, just a, a, a family. It's a pretty big family, but they're just an isolated family. So how does God take this guy from an isolated family and takes him and puts him second in command in one of the most powerful nations in the world? How does that happen? It doesn't just happen by God just going, okay, here you go. You're in charge. That's not how it worked. God, the pain that Joseph experienced was part of God's plan. They were trying to hurt him, but their intentions actually were part of the plan. There is no plan B with God. He doesn't take lemons and make lemonade. It was his plan the whole time. And so in order for him to get there, he had to go through slavery. He had to go through being put in prison. He had, to be, he had to be forgotten for a couple years, and then finally, oh yeah, now we're back. The pain was part of the plan, so their intentions actually serve God's intentions. And I think that's way, way more powerful that you, that you don't have God as not a firefighter just putting out fires here and there. It's like, no, this is all part of his plan. And so to get a kind of a fuller sense of why that is and how that is, we're going to look at uh, Romans chapter 8. And it says uh, in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 32, and it, it's kind of an argument that kind of builds one on top of the other. So I'm kind of read a little bit and stop and kind of explain how this argument is working here. And, and a lot of this is a pretty familiar verse, verses 8, uh, 828. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. You know, and you, you hear people say this all the time. Well, everything works out for good. Everything works out for good. Yes, it does. But let's put a little meat behind that because a lot of times people say that and it's just wishful thinking. Like there's, no, there's no, nothing behind it. It's just, it's just fluff. So let's actually put some meat to that. And that's what this, this passage intends to do. Put a little bit of meat behind that. It says that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And we're going to kind of see how that works in the next couple verses because what good are we talking about? It works everything for the good. What do we mean by that? 
How, how does it work for your good? Does that mean everything is good and that you're happy all the time? Well, you and I, everybody knows that that's not true. You've experienced heartache. You've experienced people stabbing you in the back. That's not how it works. So what does this mean? What is this good that we're working toward, that he's working for us? So then we go on in the next verse. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. There's one of those goals. He's chosen them to become like his son. That's one of God's goals for us, become like Jesus. So that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. So in other words, when God brings us to him, he, he makes us right with, with God because of Jesus' death on the cross. And then having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So that's the end goal right there, is that that's what he means when he's working all things for our good. He's working all things so that we can be like Jesus and so that we can share in his glory. So when he says he works all things for our good, that's what he means. All things are working to, towards those two purposes. Okay? If that's not enough, he, he ends up even going further with the argument. So what shall we say about such wonderful things as these, the stuff we just talked about? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? It's kind of a rhetorical question there. If God's for us, who can ever be against us? Well, lots of people are against us. That's what we're talking about. When people are against you, people are stabbing you in the back. People are trying to hurt you. So he's not saying that's never going to happen. I think what Paul's meaning is, who can ever be against us successfully? If God is working everything towards our good with the goal, number one being to be like Jesus, and number two, sharing in his glory, then who can really ever be against you successfully? Everything that they do is going to work towards those two goals. So, the, the, and, and I think the next verse right here, this is, God, this is Paul's mic drop here. This is, this is kind of the seal of the deal on the argument to leave no doubt. And, the, and, the, and this kind of wraps this part all up. In verse 32, he says this. Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Okay, so in other words, he's saying if God gave us his son, that's the hard part, won't he also work everything else out towards our good so that we can be like him and share in his glory? Right, that's the easy part. I mean, it, those of us that have children know how hard it would be to sacrifice our child, right? That would be extremely tough. That's the hard thing, okay? If he's going to do that, then he's certainly going to work everything else out towards our good, all right? It's kind of like this. The, the argument is working from if the, the hard to easier. I had a, a kid that I played high school football with, and for those of you that, that haven't played high school football or um, early in the summer, you do what's called two-a-days, and that means you usually have two practices a day, and they're normally pretty tough. I know you, know you have to get up early, you're tired, you're sore. And when you do two practices in a day, it really takes a toll on you, you physically. Um, where I went to school at, how our two-a-days worked is that we had our, our first practice. We were on the field at 7.20 in the morning. So for a teenager, that's pretty early. At 7.20 in the morning, we stretched. And then the very first thing we did was run, just condition. I mean, we had this brutal drill we called the fourth quarter drill. We did it every day, the first thing after we stretched. And then at the end of that first practice, we ran some more. We conditioned more. So then we, we went in, we had a little bit of a break, got something to eat, came back out for another practice, and then at the end of that second practice, we conditioned more. And so you can imagine how tough and how grueling that is. Now, after you get done with your two-a-days, you start getting into your scrimmages, you get into your regular season, the practice becomes a little bit easier. You have one practice a day. You, do, you condition, but not quite as much. You, you know, they're not running you to death because you've got a game to get ready to play for for Friday. Um, and, and the season kind of has a nice little routine to it. You know what Monday's going to be like. You know what Tuesday, you know what every day is going to be like. You get in a routine, and it's a lot easier than two-a-days. Two-a-days are just brutal. So I had this guy on my team for three years in a row. He would, come out for, he would come out for football. He'd go through all of two-a-days, all that hard stuff. And right after two-a-days were over, he quit. Did it three years in a row. And it's like, that, that's where this logic kind of works out. If he could go through two-a-days, why wouldn't he just stick it out and finish out the season? That's not that hard. And that's the same logic that Paul is using here with, with Christ. He says, look, it, God, if God has given us his son, the hard thing, and Jesus has taken that wrath for our sins and, 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 and died a brutal death on the cross. He's done that. Won't he also work everything else out 
to our, for our good. So what I like about that is that it takes away, it takes away anything that's going to destroy you. It takes away its destructive power. Anybody tries to hurt you, they can't because God will work all things out for our good, including them. They're going to just score a basket in their own, in our, their own goals, what's going to happen. They're trying to hurt you and stop God's purposes. What they're actually doing is fulfilling God's purposes. And so Joseph realized that, is that, look, you intended this for harm, but God intended it for good. And so he realized the sovereignty of God in that situation. And that promise that God will work everything out for his good, he acted on that promise, and it allowed him to, be, to forgive them. The last attribute of God is the glory of God. And we see this in, at the end of verse 20. He says that he brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. You see, Joseph was aware of God's plan. He was aware of God's purpose, God's glory, God's plan. He said, look, and the thing that, that I find really, really striking about this is that Joseph didn't say, see, look, it all worked out. I'm, I'm in charge now. See, it worked out because I'm in charge. That's not what he said. Like, for me, I'd be like, see, I was right. I was right. You guys were wrong, and I was right. It's a, you know, it makes me look good. But Joseph, on the other hand, said, no, it really wasn't about me. He said, look, I was able to fulfill God's purpose. I, I could save people's lives because when he got put in charge of all of, the, um, of all that grain in Egypt, he was able to store it, and a lot of people's lives were saved. Like, if he, if he didn't do what he did, people all over the country of Egypt would have starved and the surrounding nations would have starved. But because God used him and put them in that position to save all these other people, rather than he put me in this position to show how awesome I am. And I'm like, I was like, wow, that really just, this just floors me, is that, that it's all about the glory of, of God, not about my own glory. And that's what Joseph saw, is he saw God's glory, and, and, and he knew God's glory, so that his glory, it really didn't matter that much to him. And we see the same thing here in, uh, in Philippians when Paul is talking. The Apostle Paul writes, writes something like that in Philippians. And the Apostle Paul's in jail here, and, and we can see this here, the same thought process. So Paul says this, he says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here, he's in jail, he's been beaten, has helped to spread the good news. He's more concerned with that, that, that the good news is spread and that God is glorified. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. So he's able to witness to the, his guards and people in the, uh, some powerful people in the Roman Empire. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know that I have been appointed to defend the good news. Now this is the part I find amazing. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. So these people are preaching the gospel out of spite, just to spite Paul, to make his chains more painful to him. Now, if that were me, I'd be like, these people are terrible, and, and they're awful people, and I don't know what in the world's wrong with them, and I'm right. That, that's what I'd be saying. But that's not what he says. He says, but that doesn't matter. I, that's the first statement. What? It doesn't matter? I'm really mad about this. It does matter. No, Paul says, no, it doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Whether their motives are genuine, false or genuine, the message of Christ is being preached either way. For I, so I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. When we see the glory of God... It frees us from a lot of that bitterness and anger, you know, because for Paul, he's, he's like, you know, hey, they, they're trying to hurt me with their message. They're trying to, but it doesn't matter because Christ is being preached. God's glory is being shown, and that, that was his goal. It wasn't about him, and so that when you get freed from yourself like that and you look something higher than yourself, you can, you can forgive people without bitterness, without anger, without, without resentment because it's really not about you. It's about God's glory, and he will make sure that he is glorified. So to wrap it all up, so if you've been done, done dirty, you've been done wrong, somebody's done you wrong, okay, remember these three attributes of God. Now, with each attribute comes a promise. 
So we remember the justice of God, and the promise that comes with it is he will make it right. You don't have to. He will make it right. Remember God's justice. Remember his sovereignty. He, is under, he has it under control, and it's part of his plan, and, and he will work it all for good. And, and we are guaranteed that because of the death of his son. If he died for us, certainly he's going to work everything else out for our good. It's as sure as the, as the death of Jesus Christ is. It's blood bought, it's precious, it's a precious promise. And, and we remember the glory of God. When we see God's glory, then we're not worried about our fame, our glory, and making things right for ourselves. We're worried about God's glory and, and, and showing how awesome he is. And when we can remember these promises, it frees us from, instead of having to be bitter and seeking revenge, and having that as an obsession, having God as our obsession, and being filled with joy and peace because we trust in him. So let's pray.